This video will discuss the basics of molecular vibrations in polyatomic molecules. So what we've discussed thus far is the case of the vibrations of a diatomic molecule. So a diatomic molecule only has one bond length or one internal degree of freedom. And in general, molecules have many more than that as they have more than two atoms. So this will be an intro into what we what you do in order to get the vibrational frequencies for a polyatomic molecule and more of the ideas of what's involved in doing that. Okay, so we have our position variables, which we can imagine uh, an, a vector for each individual atom. This is a water molecule here. I've got uh, two bond lengths, R1 and R2, and a bond angle, theta. So the Cartesian positions of the oxygen X naught, X O, Y O, Z O are in the vector R O. Hydrogen 1 in a vector X H1, Y H1, Z H1. Similarly for hydrogen 2, it has a vector with its three coordinates X H2, Y H2, Z H2. So our total position of our molecule is represented as a vector of these three vectors. So the vector of the coordinates of the oxygen hydrogen 1 and hydrogen 2. In total this is a vector of nine coordinates for these three atoms going from all the way from x of the oxygen to z of hydrogen 2. So in general if we have n nuclei we'll have three n coordinates as each of them has an x, y, and z position. Alright so our potential energy function that we have to specify for our Hamiltonian v of r, r of all three n coordinates, it will be a 3n dimensional potential energy surface. So at every single value of every single one of these coordinates, we have to know what is the potential energy. Similarly, we're also going to know uh, for a Taylor series of this, what is the gradient of that energy. So that's the vector that has all of the first derivatives of all of these coordinates. So the sum from n equals the sum from i equals 1 up to 3n for 3n coordinates. First derivative of our potential energy surface with respect to displacement in one of these individual coordinates and then over all of the coordinates we have. That's the gradient which is our analog of the first derivative. So if our gradient is equal to 0 for every single coordinate then we're said to be at a stationary point. So let's say that we don't want some complicated function for our potential energy. We want a second order Taylor series. So that means that our potential energy is approximately the Taylor series at this minimum energy geometry. So we're going to have a stationary point, which is a minimum in energy. So where the bond lengths and bond angle are at a minimum value of energy. So we're going to expand around that minimum. So V of R naught, which we're going to set to be zero plus the sum over from i equals 1 to 3n of all the first derivatives with respect to the energy times their displacement minus their equilibrium value. And that's going to be 0 as well because at this stationary point, at this minimum energy geometry, the gradient is all going to be 0. So the first non-zero term is going to be what we call the Hessian elements. So this will be a matrix, so we'll have a sum from i equals 1 to 3n times another sum from j equals 1 to 3n of all of the second partial derivatives uh, d squared v dxi dxj. So partial derivatives with respect to each of these nine coordinates, 9 times 9 would give us 81 coordinates, so there would be 3n squared of these second derivatives we would have to do then times their value minus their equilibrium value uh, for each of those two coordinates. So this is, in, this is how you would do a general Taylor series for a multi-dimensional function up to a second order. Okay, so these, these second derivatives here, we're going to write in shorthand as Hij, second derivative evaluated where these Xi and Xj, one of these coordinates, are at both of their equilibrium values. And then we're going to build a big matrix H 
which is a 3N by 3N matrix called the Hessian matrix, which contains all of these mixed uh, second partial derivatives. All right, so this is a 3N by 3N matrix. It is going to be Hermitian, so it's going to have eigenvectors which are real if we're at a stationary point at a minimum. Uh, sorry, eigenvalues that are real. But more importantly, it's going to have eigenvectors. So the eigenvectors of this Hessian matrix are what we call the normal modes. Those are going to be the vibrational modes of this system. So there's going to be three n normal modes of this Hessian matrix. Three of those are going to be translations. Three of those are going to be rotations. If it's linear, there's only two rotations. And then 3n minus 6 of those are going to be what we're interested in, vibrations. If it's, non, if it's linear, then there's going to be 3n minus 5 vibrations. Okay, so those are the eigenvectors giving you the normal modes, which we represent by these kind of big capital Q here. The eigenvalues of this Hessian matrix are going to give us what we call the force constants, how strongly, these, uh, how strongly and how quickly these normal modes are going to vibrate. So those will be represented by this capital H, the eigenvalues of this Hessian matrix. So now our uh, vibrational Hamiltonian is equal to a sum from I equals 1 to 3n minus 6, and it is separable in all of these normal modes, minus h bar squared over 2 mu of that normal mode, second derivative with respect to that normal mode, plus 1 half force constant, which is like our K in the harmonic oscillator, our spring constant, times the normal mode squared. So this is like our this is like our Hamiltonian for a one-dimensional harmonic oscillator separable over all of these individual terms. So this gives us an energy for each of these normal modes, which is equal to Planck's constant times their individual frequency times their individual quantum numbers plus one half. The quantum number for every normal mode is an integer. Every one of them it starts at zero and goes up to infinity, but for most of them at room temperature it's going to be zero. All right, and then these frequencies are going to be equal to one over two pi, square root of the eigenvalue force constant, divided by this effective reduced mass of our mode. Um, this mode, this reduced mass is not the same reduced mass from harmonic oscillator. What we do in practice is we use, instead of these coordinates, we use what are called mass-weighted coordinates, where we multiply times the square root of the mass in each of the atom that these coordinates belong to. But you can think of it as an effective reduced mass of the individual normal modes. So in summary, uh, the eigenvectors of this Hessian tell us the direction that the atoms are going to vibrate and the force constants tell us how fast they're going to vibrate in that way. So for water, we have three internal degrees of freedom, 3n minus 6 for a nonlinear molecule, n equals 3, that's going to be three vibrations. Those three modes are the three eigen uh, vectors of the Hessian matrix, which are not translations or rotations. The first is called, we have three of them, um, one is called the symmetric stretch. That's at 3,657 wave numbers. You can see the hydrogens are stretching symmetrically. Another called the asymmetric stretch, where one goes out while the other decreases, R1 and R2. 3,756 wave numbers for that one. And the last one, 1,595 wave numbers, uh, where the bond angle is changing, kind of a scissoring motion there, is where the uh, where the hydrogens are moving in and out, changing the bond length, or changing the bond angle, but the bond length is remaining pretty much unchanged. So that's the basics of molecular vibrations for polyatomics. Our potential energy is a Taylor series in three n dimensions up into second order. The second order terms of these partial derivatives form the Hessian matrix. The eigenvectors of that determine the normal modes the direction in which they vibrate, and the eigenvalues determine the force constant, the frequency at which those normal modes are going to vibrate.